Well, I remember drawing, um, drawing airplanes dropping bombs on the islands um, where my father was uh, during the war in Samoa. The, the war was a strange sort of thing. I mean, we were on the edge of something similar at the moment. We'll be sending our boys off to this island or that island or China or wherever it's going to be. So that's how it started for me. And I, I used to send these um, drawings back with my mother uh, in her post. And I saw some of them. It was really strange to, to go back. So those are some of the first cognitive marks I made. And they would be when I was about seven, six or seven, something like that. Amazing. Have you kept those drawings? Look, uh, my daughter's probably hidden them away somewhere. I have family. <laughs> and they all uh, are circling now. <laughs> It's like that. Uh, that's that's what I, I, it really, in, in reality, it's uh, phone calls. Uh, Ruby needs a, a new set of teeth. So, so that's how I cope with my family. Uh, pay their bills. Um, which, it's an amazing. An artist that has enough money to pay for his grandchild's teeth. I would hope so after a career like yours. Well, it's been pretty ragged, you know, but and uh, it's been interesting. What's your highlight? Oh, it's just too many highlights, really. Yeah. And they would involve women that wouldn't want to be talked about. <laughs> I meant art highlights. <laughs> It's, but you'd obviously spent a lot of time in New Plymouth and there's that, we'll, we'll touch on this painting behind you eventually. Um, no, let's touch a, on it now. New Plymouth, we... Yeah, in, in New Plymouth, as a young artist, and I mean, I used to pack up my gear in my suitcase, little child suitcase, and uh, my art teacher gave me an easel to work with, a fold-up one. And I used to take that and my little suitcase full of stuff out into the street and set up anywhere I could and paint. And I painted people walking up and down the street in New Plymouth. Uh, well, I would have been 16 or 17, I suppose. 18, maybe. So that was in the 50s? So, yeah, if you want to do the maths. I'm <laughs> not much good at maths. But so uh, I got to know that's those streets pretty well. I used to get up at four o'clock in the morning because, you know, when you're sleeping with somebody else, they're restless, so you've got to get up. And, and I'd get on my bike and I'd ride down into town. I'd ride into town and I'd, I'd come around that corner there and into, into the, and that's me there in the corner. Uh, I was a, a supervisor of a gang of very loose women <laughs> who used to do the uh, scrubbing and cleaning of various parts of the railway station. And uh, they used to, they had set up, they had a real setup. You're in your 20s now. Yeah. Yeah, I've done the maths. And, uh, and, she, and so I had to make sure that people didn't walk into the toilets at the wrong time. <laughs> and so I'd have to go out there with my machine and polish the floor until they'd finished and then I could go back and get on with the work of cleaning up the railway station. But I mean, the, I can't remember their names. I don't think they ever told me their I names. I remember yours. They might. They might come out of the darkness some night and say, you bastards. So <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about New Plymouth in the 60s. What was it like? Was it a, um, was it a little backcountry town? Was it a, um, looks like there's a bit of public transport there. Are you painting 
That's no. usually come up to me and they'd say, Are you painting? Are you <laughs> painting? And I'd be out there, I'd paint all over the place. <laughs> an easel with a thing on it, you know, of something I was working on. Oh, are you painting? And I'd say, yeah. yeah. Oh, do you do this often? Uh, so people were, I shocked the hell out of people really. There was an art society in New, in New Plymouth at that stage and, and they, it was full of, uh, what do I say full of, it, it was uh, maintained by a group of women who used to be more interested in making the tea out the back. And if you were in a situation like this and you were having to talk to people, the ladies out the back would be banging the bloody cups and saucers around <laughs> so that you couldn't hear anything. They were very vindictive people, and they painted hydrangeas and things, <laughs> things of that nature. Which well, I, I got nothing against hydrangeas, in fact. Of course not. Uh, but uh, but and anyway, I joined their club. Yeah, you know, I went, and, and my father became a president at one stage, and so I had an inter to the uh, art society. So. Uh, and so that's a, a large part of my understanding of New Plymouth is that s sort of attitude that came from America. Uh, it, my father used to work with Ivan Watkins. They were a local f firm that sold plants and things. But uh, the Americans came in and decided to develop this area. And it wasn't long before we were producing stuff to drop on the uh, people in Vietnam and kill off all their trees and uh, mm -hmm. I could get onto that one but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I'll say is uh, that after my father died I was cleaning out the basement and I came across uh, a whole lot of um, sacks on the floor that had been spread out full of this toxic salts and things. So I scraped up a heap of them and I put them in a sack and I took them up to Ivan Watkins Tower. That was, there was still a man on the gate up there. And I said, here, take these. He says, what are those? I said, they're, they're what helped to kill my father. I said, you can have those. And he stepped back and disappeared. <laughs> and there was a point in time where you left New Plymouth and you went south. Oh. Well, I got uh, married to Elizabeth. We were, at the time, we were looking after um, the Gables, which was a beautiful old building in New Plymouth. It was, we weren't getting paid for looking after the Gables. So I had a, an aunt who lived in central Otago, in Patiaroa, and uh, not far from Ranfurly. We t took the plunge and we, went and lived out there in a, a very nice little sun-dried brick cottage. And I did a lot of uh, paintings and drawings. Uh, did you climb the mountain? I never climbed the mountain. I'm not a mountain climber. Mm. I dive, go down to the bottom of the sea, but I've been, you know, if you're diving, all you can do is sink. But if you're climbing, you can fall. Yeah, you did some great paintings of the mountain, though. You, uh, I was forced to. Yeah. It was there. It was there. Uh, people wonder about the, uh, the effect it has on people. You know, uh, having that mountain is like having the pyramids in your backyard. You know, it's really, really, really strong. And it affects people. They build their houses so that the roof angles and things uh, go with the mountain. Mm. It, it's got a long history. It's got the Maori history, of course, and that's why we call it Taranaki now. In those days, it was called Mount Egmont. Uh, and there was a young boy called Hefe who came out on a ship from England as a, a young man to try and make his fortune in Taranaki. Because Taranaki was one of the few places where you could come ashore without being eaten. There, there was, you know, it was a firmly established um, colony of soldiers and flag masts and, you know, all this sort of thing. And, what was it? <laughs> and anyway, he came ashore uh, and his father was a painter. 
but he came ashore and he started to do uh, drawings and paintings of uh, the, the th things that would appeal to people who might come and live in Taranaki. Because uh, you, if you came to live in Taranaki, you came to, to live with, you, do, you didn't know what you came to live with. You anchored off the bay there for ages and ages and ages. And that's why eventually they moved down to Nelson. But uh, that painting there of the breakwater is part of that type of thing. That's what kept us safe, was that breakwater. Those, they were called Akmons those big concrete things, and they were designed and made on the spot by the locals and then taken, dumped over the edge and to save us from the sea. Save you from the Tasman. Yeah. You met Elizabeth in New Plymouth. Oh, yes. Well, we won't go into that. But you have There's a book there that will tell you a lot about those sorts of things. Okay. But the thing about meeting Elizabeth was that I drew her. Uh, I mean, I've just recently had an, an experience of showing um, one of the prints that I'd made based on one of the paintings that I'd made that's in the New Plymouth Gallery. Uh, it's, it's called The Yellow Rubber Gloves. And I, 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 Elizabeth, now we talk about Elizabeth, was at the sink, as usual, and, and she had finished the dishes and had torn off with her gloves and thrown them on the bench. She was quite angry a lot of the time. I don't know why. <laughs> <coughs> and I said to her, stop. I've got to paint that. So um, I made a little fence around it with various instruments and things. And I said, don't touch that until I've done a decent drawing of it. And I did a decent drawing. It took me about three days. And then I did a decent painting, and now it's famous. So it's, where is it's, that painting? It's in the Gavetbury Street Art Gallery, yeah, yeah. and they might bring it out if you... Uh, I think it might have been there. I think it's one of the few of my paintings that the Gavette Brewster bothers to show. They've got hundreds of my works in there, drawings, prints, paintings, you name it, they've got them. But they're all stuck away in the storage room. And uh, anyway... The thing about the rubber, rubber gloves is that I recognised at the moment that happened that I was seeing seeing something <laughs> that I was able to see something excuse me it's an emotional moment, you know, when suddenly you realise you can see something. Yeah, absolutely. As a painter, of course, I don't go around weeping. <laughs> I just you see are. something. But I do. I see things. That's an incredible story. You're so obviously there were further domestic. Oh, there were. You, they, you, I, I never, you know, uh, eventually... We broke up because I, uh, Elizabeth had objected to me smoking dope, I think, at the time. And she was going to ring the police. So I said, no, you're bloody not. And I, <laughs> I got the hockey stick and I smashed the, the phone into little pieces. Bankety, bankety. Didn't hurt her at all. She wasn't in it. Right? She, I made sure she kept out of the way. Uh, and then uh, next week, of course, the guy came round and he said, do you think this was done on purpose? <laughs> uh, so uh, there's a lovely painting of Thomas, who was the second child. And he is blowing a balloon, a bubble, a bubblegum balloon. And I, that was another thing I saw. Uh, we don't really uh, understand what artists have to go through to actually get their ideas out there. And the, 
And when you all oh, think very much, is oh, I should have put it on top. <laughs> cheers, cheers, Michael. Yeah, cheers. Your one's got a little bit of vodka in it. <laughs> And it, you, you have to push so hard. Do they, um, do they recognise you? No. They didn't? You had to really, no. You had to prove it. You had something to prove. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, at the time, I, sp I suppose there was, I, I was out there publicly doing it, doing all sorts of things, painting murals and... Uh, creating all sorts of problems for people because <laughs> they had to go and take them off. You know. But some of the, my best work has been done on the back wall of the, of the New Plymouth Museum and it's gone. And it was a big polyphonic chord, beautiful thing. And I had a letter from a friend, uh, Shannon Novak, and he's doing odd jobs for the Gavette Brewster Art Gallery Council. And he'd been going through their files and he came across the original um, drawing for that m mural. And at the time, you know, I got them to see me then because I had to get up on a ladder on top of a fire truck to, to finish it, you know, at the, the top. <laughs> So people took notice of that, but they, they didn't take any notice when it was being painted out. So many of my best works have gone under the, the brushes of fools. <laughs> anyway, we're st I'm still doing it. And up the road uh, on the 20, what? 26th. 26th. There'll be an exhibition of my uh, paintings of uh, polyphonic chords and things. Yes, that's good. And any so for tell you. Tell us about those. Tell us about the music, because music has obviously been hugely influential. Well, in it, they, they're about the, the dance. You can't have music without the dance. And I spent years uh, just dancing, drawing those things over and over again. And I made 12 of them. And they were first shown at the uh, gallery in Palmerston, no, not Palmerston, uh, Lower Hut. And it was a, a score, uh, which you'll be able to see when you have a look at it, uh, of the, these images, uh, which were to be played by four, four cellists. And so they got out there and, and they played these. People were stunned. They said it sounded like World War Three. Well, that's not unusual. I was born in 1939 to that sound. Yeah, you were. Uh, and when I was working here in Auckland, I had a studio in K Road. And I'm talking so peculiarly because I've got my mouth full of teeth. Uh, uh, and I'd made some of these shapes and things as, as poles and coloured them along the same principles as the polyphonic chords. And the studio that I had was right on top of, almost outside of, you could say, the local fire station. And I was working away on these one day and they this the fire siren went off for the siren to leave the building and i saw these paintings light up and i i made the connection 
I saw it. But I'm not, uh, I don't go around saying, oh, that colour's that, but there is a reason why we see colours and hear things, and sometimes they're connected. Well, you certainly express it in your work. Well, and, and we don't know, because we're not Michael Smith or we're not trained to think in that direction. Mm. It's just another bloody noisy siren. And, and that's what I would like to say was what I was going to start off this talk about was you are so privileged to have a place that shows work and it looks after it. Yeah. And this man here and his team, they make available to you a variety of things. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good, some of them are brilliant, some of them make me want to, you know, get the axe out and chop them up. But that's just a pure uh, sort of reaction, you know. And I don't, but I do know what it feels like. Well, I've been to your studio a few times and um, I can't say any, there's anything there that I, that I haven't liked, but I do recall um, coming down to see you. It was quite a rare event, actually, when a, when a well-known, well, I mean, perhaps the most well-known senior artist in the country consigns a work of art to an auction. Um, and that was, that was, I mean, it was a huge privilege for us, Michael, to be handling the uh, St. Francis and the Wolf which at the time I think may have fetched a record um, and it's unusual for a, a, such a major artist to consign this work and, and uh, it did, did very well. St Francis and the Wolf, obviously um, religious background. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your well, religious background? I was brought up a Catholic. And I went to church every Sunday, and I went to confession on the day before, if possible, so I could clean myself enough to be received communion the next day. But to tell you the truth, I had to actually invent sins. I had to invent things. Because I couldn't think what to say. <laughs> So in the end, I, I had to say, oh, I'll pull myself off again. <laughs> and he said, that's all right, son, you three Hail Marys and an Alpha, and off you go. <laughs> like, the church gets a, a terrible knocking for some of the terrible things that happen in churches, but terrible things happen everywhere. And, and I, some of the best people I've met have been religious people. I have two aunts who are nuns. Yeah. Two aunts. It's also been very evident in your work, you know. Well, um, I couldn't that. avoid it. Yeah. I, I, when I went to church on Sunday, there around the walls was Jesus being crucified, scourged, his cloak's torn off, a crown of thorns stuck on. And I looked at it and I thought, shit, I've got to do better than that. <laughs> so I decided it would be my task in life at that stage, I would have been in my teens, to make a better job of it, to give it more oomph, you know, make it real, which I did. And I did a station to the cross for a church uh, across the road in New Plymouth of the station to the cross, which uh, the journey of Christ through that time. I mean, you can't. You can't be involved in that stuff without being affected. You have to be moved. If you're not moved, you're dead. So St. Francis. 
uh, became one of my favourite saints because I could make a nicer connection from being crucified to looking after animals and looking after each other and things like that. So St. Francis became my favourite saint. And I did, <laughs> did a lot of, several paintings of him and I did a little beautiful book full of drawings that Elizabeth did palms for. But... Uh, he was the saint of animals, wasn't he? Well, he's become known as the, the saint of the environment, really. Uh, he understood that everything counted. Uh, when he was buried, they, they, he insisted that they strip him naked and lay him on the ground. Because that's where he wanted to be. And he referred to the flames of the fire as sister fire. And he talked to the birds and, well, who doesn't talk to the birds? I'd go every morning and talk to the birds. Uh, St. Francis, I, I did St. Francis receiving the stigmata and I've got him lying back in a field full of daisies with his arms and feet out and the nail holes there. It's a beautiful painting. <coughs> it was a pair of paintings, wasn't it? Hmm? It was a pair of paintings. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'll get around to that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the one of the stigmata and stuff has got a nice little ordinary story that goes with it. And that's that when it was shown in uh, uh, years ago in the gallery up the road here, it was the Auckland Art Gallery, a uh, special bloody privilege. They were going to collapse and pull everything out, so they thought they'd have an exhibition of Smither before they finally left. <laughs> uh, so they did. Yeah. But as part of it, there was St Francis having the stigmata. Uh, but when it was shown, uh, I got this lovely story of one of the people came up to me. He said, you're not going to believe this, but my son has gone and he's put sticking plasters over the feet and the hands of Francis. Because he wouldn't be allowed within 100 yards of the bloody paintings now. But I thought that was terrific. Uh, real. The other painting in that duo. Uh, was St Francis relaxing with his feet in the water uh, and, a, and some goldfish swimming around his feet, or carp actually there were, which was, uh, yeah, so those are one, two, three, yeah, so I've done a lot of St Francis. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm sure everyone's really enjoyed that.